Hi everyone. Hello again. On page 459 of In Search of Christian Freedom, Ray Franz has been discussing the mm, what he calls flawed deductive reasoning of the Watchtower in the way they analyzed that well God has an organization, Satan has an organization, and they actually reason backwards from Satan has an organization, so he's mimicking or imitating God's organization. He continues that thought here. Along the same line, an article titled Jehovah's Organization Moves Ahead, Are You Moving With It? published in the December 1, 1982 Watchtower, begins thus, quote, You cannot read the Christian Greek scriptures without being impressed by the fact that Christians were organized for worship. In particular, they were organized to preach, to spread the good news of God's kingdom, end of quote. Anyone reading the Christian Greek scriptures or New Testament would certainly be impressed with the fact that early Christians were motivated to worship and share the good news. But motivation and being organized are not the same thing. Today, Jehovah's Witnesses have organized meetings, five a week, each with its organized program. They have organized semi-annual circuit and annual district or regional assemblies with their organized programs. They have organized field witnessing activity with organized group witnessing, organized territory coverage, organized magazine day activity, a field overseer to organize this activity and keep watch on the reports of activity turned in each month by each witness, and circuit and district overseers on organized weekly schedules with the prime responsibility of overseeing and promoting this organized congregational activity. Where does one find in the inspired scriptures anything even remotely resembling such a systematized, institutionalized, programmed approach to worship and to the sharing of the good news? Mm -hmm. In actuality, the lack of any formal program and the apparent spontaneity and individual motivation of the first century Christians are what are most remarkable in the accounts we do find in the Bible. We find only the barest of suggestions of what their meetings were like, and no indication of any methodology or systematization in their proclaiming of the good news. I recall that during the years I served in circuit and district overseer activity, I used to puzzle over this when preparing the service talks that were a regular feature of the weekly program when visiting congregations. I wanted to prepare talks that were scriptural, but it seemed so difficult to find scriptures that even faintly reflected the kind of organized service urged by the headquarters in its publications. I found it hard to understand how the, apostle, the apostles Peter, Paul, and John, and the disciples James and Jude could write entire letters to the congregations and never say anything stressing the need for the readers of those letters to get out and go from door to door. Nothing about organized witnessing arrangements at scheduled times, about putting in more hours in the field service, or similar approaches or topics, all things stressed, regularly stressed in the Watchtower Society's publications. The letters of the apostles and disciples seemed deficient according to the viewpoint that had been developed in me. It eventually became clear after some decades that the real problem lay with the viewpoint inculcated in me, a viewpoint that actually perverted the first century record, manipulating it to make it say something it did not actually say. False deduction is employed from the broad principle that all Christians should share the good news, deductions are made to support and cover virtually every aspect of the organization's systematized approach to worship and preaching. But those deductions are unjustified, as indicated by the absence of corroborative evidence in the scriptures themselves. The systematized, highly programmed approach to Christianity that is developed bears greater resemblance to that of a large sales organization than to the first century Christian congregation and its simple, uncomplicated approach to worship and service to God. As has been shown, the strong organizational attitude developed 
has a definite molding influence on the thinking of Jehovah's Witnesses. Loyalty to the organization becomes the touchstone, the criterion, the bottom line when it comes to determining whether one is a faithful Christian or not. It is the absence in the inspired word of God of that kind of attitude and spirit, not the absence of a mere word that today causes many witnesses to express a serious concern. The message of the Bible as a whole is against placing one's faith in any earthly organization or any group of men or a single man. To do so is to endanger the personal relationship with God that the scriptures do inculcate. Reading the history of God's dealings with humankind, one can see that God regularly dealt with individuals, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, and a host of others. It is probably in calling on examples in the Hebrew scriptures for support of its organizational concept that the Watchtower literature most frequently resorts to the fallacy of false analogy. We may remember that in this fallacy the analogy fails not because there are no similarities whatsoever, but because they are not sufficient to give validity to the analogy. In reality, in many cases of Watchtower application, the similarities are far outweighed by the differences. The only actual example we have of an organization, in the sense in which the term is used in Watchtower literature, is with the establishment of the nation of Israel. Whatever comparison may be made with the Christian congregation, it is clear that Christianity marked a notable break with the past, that God's dealings with his servants were placed on a new footing through Christ in an eminently superior and distinctive way. The shadows have given way to the reality. To try to establish the relationship of Christians to God and Christ on the basis of analogies with the Israelite national framework is no more proper than to equate, equate Christ's sacrifice and what it accomplishes with the animal sacrifices made back then. The difference is far, far greater than the similarity. Nothing illustrates more clearly that one's loyalty and one's trust in God cannot safely be bound with an organization than does the history of that nation, that is Israel. God established an official priesthood for the nation, and later, at the people's request, he established a human kingship, though making plain that the people's petition for some visible sign of government was evidence of a lack of faith in him, the true king. Over a span of some five centuries, faithful kings were rare in Judah and completely lacking in the later northern kingdom of Israel. Out of some 24 Judean kings, the reigns of only six are described favorably in scripture, and even these were tarnished with deviations from the divine will. Similarly, the priesthood provided no consistently reliable guide for the people, the priests frequently going along with the kings in their deviations from the divine will, and thus contributing to the degeneration of the pure worship of God. It is little wonder that the psalmist admonishes, and these are familiar words to witnesses, quote, do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On, on that very day, their plans come to nothing. Notice it's plans come to nothing, not thoughts perish. Mm -hmm. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, Jehovah his God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think these, these are very good points, especially the one about when you compare it to uh, Israel as God's organization. It was their lack of faith that made them want to mm. have a, a govern a, a visible government. Like the pagans. So and then the watchtower says God has always used an organization and he needs an organization. Mm. So we need to lack faith. That, that's that's how that would follow then. And we're all familiar with this quote from the Psalms, right? Don't put your trust in princes, but we don't think of it as being distrust. Within. In, within the organization, 
because the Psalms are often, mm -hmm. they're Psalms of lament, a complaint against God's organization on the behalf of even someone like David mm -hmm. is often complaining about the way he's being treated by the king of the organization. King in the case of Saul or princes when he was king himself, other mm -hmm. aristocrats within the so-called organization of God, yeah. Yeah. We wanted to link on your screen to a video we did not that long ago on Acts chapter 11 where you have the clear indication that in the book of Acts and in the rest of the New Testament, the churches were not, and I say plural churches, not church, or congregation, or organization. The churches individually were not being directed from Jerusalem or by men at all. They were being organized, if you want to use that word at all, organically by the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's going up on your screen. Also the playlist which we developed to d deal with this entire contrast between the organic way that God does business in the Bible, as Ray says here, using individuals before Israel mm -hmm. and using individuals even in during the period that Israel had five mm -hmm. centuries of kings, but also that in the New Testament you miss that God is using individuals still, mm -hmm. not groups to accomplish his first purpose. Yeah, I think that's just a video, not a playlist, because we found it was just in the Jehovah's Witness one. It is, uh, it's in a playlist, but I, yeah, I misspoke. We should, if you l look at this first one that's on your screen, organic versus organized, it'll lead to several others that follow up yeah. that theme. So just follow the links. Yeah. And next time, could no one be trusted in God's organization? Because you might easily get that impression if you're Jeremiah. <laughs> or Isaiah. Or Elijah. Yeah, that's next time. Okay.